Сєвродонецьк, за підсумками, і цієї доби, вже 105-ї, до речі, доби повномасштабної війни, залишається епіцентром протистояння на Донбасі. Захищаємо наші позиції, завдаємо ворогу відчутних втрат. Це дуже жорстока битва, дуже важка. Мабуть, одна з найважчих протягом всієї цієї війни. Я вдячний кожному і кожній, хто обороняється на цьому напрямку. Багато в чому саме там зараз вирішується доля нашого Донбасу. Od Faludža do ulica Mogadiša, Andrew Milburn se borio u nekim od najkrvavijih bitaka našeg vremena i bio je prvi američki marinac koji je predvodio specijalne operacije tokom rata protiv takozvane islamske države. Završio sam pravni fakultet i učlanio se kao vojnik u Marince, zbog čega moji roditelji tada nisu bili previše sretni. Plan mi je bio da odslužim četiri godine, a zatim da se vratim i bavim se advokaturom u Londonu. Imao sam mjesto u Lincolnovom korpusu, obećali su da će ga držati otvorenim pet godina. Ali znate, ušao sam među Marince i čak i na dnu piramide počeo sam da uživam u tome i uzeo proviziju. I tako, prije nego što sam i primijetio, prošla je 31 godina. Andrew je od vojnika došao do pozicije pukovnika. Nakon penzionisanja 2019. godine postao je uspješan pisac. Međutim, sada je u Kijevu. Obučava ukrajinske specijalne vojne snage u mnogim vojnim vještinama koji im nedostaju i pomaže u uklanjanju hiljada mina koje su ostavile ruske trupe. Radimo kroz kontakte u komandi za specijalne operacije Ukrajine i osmislili smo program u kojem se momci rotiraju na prvoj liniji fronta i nudimo im preko potrebnu obuku kako bismo bili sigurni da barem koriste nišane na svom oružju kako treba, da dobiju medicinsku obuku. Obučavamo specijaliste za uklanjanje eksplozivnih naprava, njihove specijalnosti, a oni ih imaju vrlo malo, da imaju svjesnost o situaciji, dakle o improvizovanim eksplozivnim napravama i zamkama kojih su Rusi postavili mnogo tokom povlačenja. Pukovnik Milburn je nazvao svoju organizaciju Mozart Group kao odgovor na rusku zloglasnu plaćeničku firmu Wagner Group, te se ona finansira donacijama, a onima koji se pridruže, plaća se naknada za njihovu stručnost. Mi nismo nepromišljena grupa plaćenika u stilu Angole, mi gradimo kapacitete. Navodno je oko 5000 stranih dobrovoljaca krenulo prema ratnoj zoni pridružujući se slabo organizovanoj ukrajinskoj legiji stranaca. Ali Andrew kaže da su mnogi lagali o svom vojnom iskustvu i da sada plaćaju cijenu za to. Imali smo niz incidenata u kojima su se momci namirno ranili kako bi napustili borbu, zapadnjaci, britanci i amerikanci. Ne postoji ni jedna nacionalnost koja je po tome posebno podla. Svi oni to rade. Mora postojati dio provjere i procjene na granici prije nego što uđu u zemlju. A ta tačka provjere mora biti tip poput mene ili neki od momaka koji rade sa mnom, veteran. U roku od nekoliko minuta većina nas može prepoznati, bez obzira na nacionalnost, da li je neko zaista bio u vojsi. Pukovnik Milburn je rekao da je već zaposlio nekoliko veterana britanske vojske. Obim i vrsta ratovanja koji se dešava u Ukrajini razlikuju se od svega čemu je on ranije svjedočio. Gledam sve ove stručnjake, neke ljude iz predgrađa na Twitteru i Facebooku koji tvrde kako su Rusi gurnuti nazad. Rusi su najbolji u odbrani. Da, bili su nesposobni u napadu, ali koriste hrpe mina i artiljerije za granate im ne nedostaje. Njihova bombardovanja koja se dešavaju vrlo brzo se moraju vidjeti da bi se to povjerovalo. Pukovnik kaže da ga je Ukrajinu privukla želja da nešto učini, a dok se ruske trupe možda povlače iz Kijeva, on, kao i mnogi, vjeruje da je to privremena pauza dok konsoliduju snage na istoku. Najkrvavija bitka možda tek dolazi. Vojska Vladimira Putina već tri i pol mjeseca pokušava okupirati Ukrajinu, no ukrajinske odbrambene snage pružaju značajan otpor, te su na nekim područjima uspjela i odbiti ruske trupe zbog ubitka generala, drugih visokih častnika, te neumorne ukrajinske borbe. Neki američki vojni stručnjaci vjeruju da bi Putin u idućih nekoliko dana mogao predložiti čak prekid vatre. Koliko je to moguće? Da li je to uopće moguće? Moj 
Gost je bivši američki marinas koji je služio u Iraku, Afganistanu, trenutno je u Ukrajini i formirao je Mozart grupu organizaciju koja pomaže u obuci ukrajinskih snaga za specijalne operacije. Andy Milburn, Special Operations Commander in U.S. Marine Corps, Colonel Andrew Milburn Keefe joining me tonight. Colonel, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to N1. Hey, it's great to be here. It's really good to have you. Now, you were a Marine in Mogadishu, Somalia in the 90s, then subsequently mm -hmm. uh, first Marine Division during the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, you have completed mm -hmm. tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, been involved in evacuation of civilians in Libya in 2011, and commanded a special operations task force against the Islamic State, so-called Islamic State in 2016. Now, taking all this in consideration, how different or how similar is the war and your operations today in Ukraine against Russians? Yeah, so I'm going to start with the, the differences. The, you know, the, the fight against the Russians for Ukrainian troops. I, I just want to, uh, you know, I, I want to comment on the intensity it, it, for, for those of us who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, for the most part, and I'm not diminishing our service by any means, and, and, and you know, I mean, uh, day after day, uh, when, when you're losing guys, uh, it, of course it's stressful. And uh, probably the most, you know, I, I went through Battle of Fallujah, which, which was extremely intense, so clearing building, building to building, full of insurgents. But, I, but the fight here is in a different category. And I'll give you an example. You know, the guys we train, we only have five days to train them. They're brand new, you know, they're kids, right? And they, 80% of them have never even held a weapon before. We, we train them in those five days. And then they go on the front line and they are subject to, uh, you know, 10, 14 hours of uh, Russian artillery bombardment, you can imagine. And well, maybe, I mean, none of us really can imagine what that's like, um, it, to include white phosphorus, which is, uh, you know, a burning uh, material that, that the, the Russians use dropping from the sky. If it touches you, it doesn't stop burning, you know. So you can imagine being subjected to that uh, and then watching uh, columns of tanks now accompanied by infantry approach your positions. Um, they're all outnumbered invariably, the Ukrainians, when, when that happens. And they're suffering serious casualties and uh, uh, you know bravery and uh, cohesion uh, resilience they have uh, but that you know you in in the end you wonder if that's going to be if that's going to be enough uh, I've seen an article in you uh, it's a recent article from April this year actually where you said uh, the Russians are worse than the Isis how so what do you see on the ground well you know the Islamic state I'm not just find the Islamic state but for the most part, the untold story of the Islamic State is the you know the Islamic State foot soldiers were largely brainwashed. Uh, a lot of them were, were young Muslims attracted from throughout the world uh, by you know they, they were they were drawn by a cause, and the cause was not a bad one. It was opposing, for instance, Assad in Syria. They had seen reports of the atrocities there, and a lot of the guys who joined the Islamic State. This is an untold story you know, joined for the right reasons, right? And uh, that's mm -hmm. very strange, apparently, you know, for a, a Marine, um, a U.S. Marine to say, but they, they did. They were drawn by idealism, um, same way that a lot of young men are drawn to a cause. But uh, for the Russians, um, a lot of them were were forced into the army by, uh, you know, circumstances. But it, nevertheless, you know, they with their upbringing and background, um, there's no, absolutely no excuse for how they have operated here in Ukraine against uh, often people who speak the same language, share the same culture. In the end, that doesn't matter. But, you know, mass atrocities. I just came back again from Bucha yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, last time I was there was right after the Russian soldiers, drunk Russian soldiers apparently had dragged locals out. You know, some 350 had killed them, buried them in mass graves, had raped women. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is, uh, of course, it's unconscionable, but it's particularly shocking in an army that is supposed to be a professional army. 
Let's talk about the Mozart group, Orain. Now, you lead a team of special operations veterans uh, that train and equip Ukrainians in this battle against Russians. Now, how did the Mozart group come in effect? Um, it is something that you came up with, and it's pretty much operative in Ukraine today. And I also want to know about $2.6 billion worth security aid to Ukraine, and who runs the logistics, and how does this equipment reach the Ukrainian army? Does it? Okay, so first question first. Um, Mozart Group. I came out here as a journalist, actually, a freelance journalist. Um, but the problem is that I had been here before and I had friends out here serving the Ukrainian military and I very quickly realized that the job of being a journalist seemed to me quite trivial in, in comparison to what I could do. And I had friends coming out who could assist with training and that's what they really badly needed here we were training guys initially for the defensive so, so you came to you came to ukraine on march 12th is that correct yes that's correct yeah all right all right you're very well very well researched <laughs> yes march the 12th so the russians if you remember then were had almost and you know they'd almost surrounded kiev and so it was a bit of a gamble getting into kiev itself uh, we came in here, I brought in um, a few other Marine Special Operations guys, and we started training the local, essentially the, the territorial defense guys, you know, the, the, um, the, the militia. And, and they had no training at all. And yet, literally, we would give them a five-day training course, and they would go mm -hmm. uh, get in their cars and fight the Russians um, in the front line. Uh, you know, so at the time, I felt as though our efforts were inadequate, but that was the only training they received before they were, you know, they were thrown into combat and they did very well. You know, they drove the Russians back. And I think a lot of it was the fact they had uh, belief on their side. They had cohesion. Uh, they had their families behind them. This was their town and the Russians were not good at fighting in cities. So to your second point, you're asking about uh, equipment getting to the front line. Well, a couple of things. Yeah, there was a serious problem with with critical items getting to the front line for some period of time. I would say some six weeks, you know, to including medical equipment. And the and the fact is that you know if the United States, with all the best intentions, pulls equipment into a country, but they don't put their own guys across the border of that country to distribute the equipment, then obviously things are going to go wrong. And it wasn't because they were bad actors. It's just in you know the natural process of any a, you know any supply chain you've got to supervise in you've got to supervise distribution according to prioritization so bottom line is units on the front line were not getting um uh, weapons but they weren't even getting medical equipment so mm -hmm. we saw that as a mission for us to ensure that those guys got that equipment and it's been like, you know, honestly, it's been largely successful. The most part, guys on the front line now do have at least personal um, uh, first aid kits. Uh, they still lack training, and we're doing our best to try and remedy that. But we are a small group. Uh, with, and uh, I think we have a Of how effect. many? Small group of how many? Yeah, I mean, any given time, we have 25 guys. Now, that may not seem a lot, but all of my guys are special operations uh, instructors uh, and with just six guys we can train an entire battalion company by company uh, we don't have enough time with each company maybe five days but we can train an entire battalion in a month and we can train them well um, but uh, and and you know given more funding uh, we would have a greater effect we are doing what we can you can, I mean it's it, it feels like shoveling sand against the tide but we are doing what we can I mean there are citizens just just I, everyday citizens join the army, join the resistance. They need the training, they need the equipment, they need the medical supplies, right? And the Ukrainian military has undergone rapid expansion. We have seen that. And they have taken in thousands of recruits, which creates a significant training problem. Um, so 25 guys for battalions, I, I, I 
I think you guys do need to do need more people and do need more. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, g given more funding, there's no shortage of volunteers for what we're doing. So you, you're you guys, not an NGO, have a, but you're not an NGO. You can be. No, we're not. Um, you're not. So how do you get the funding? No. How do you get the funding? We, how we have to solicit funding. But the problem is, yeah, you're right. We're not an NGO because we train people um, in, in weapons training, and that is it's a no go, you right? Really, yeah. Uh, but, but the ironic <laughs> thing, here's the ironic thing, Ika. So you could be an NGO and people will donate millions of dollars to you, but what are you doing? You're putting on a band aid on, on people after the Russians mm -hmm. have you know, have hurt them. And what we're trying to do is prevent that happening. But because we're doing that, because we're training people to defend their homes and families, we are, we're not eligible to be uh, an NGO. So, you know, I mean, it's no use me getting upset about that, but it's ironic, isn't it? Um, but my guys are motivated for the right reason. They're here, they could earn a lot more money elsewhere. They're here because they realize, you know, they believe in, in um, what the Ukraine are doing but it's more than about that it's right it's about it's not about ukraine and russia it's about uh global balance of you know global rule of law it's about um about opposing some uh ethical uh, about global standards barbaric, that say that might is absolutely right. barbaric regime that is yeah. being imposed on, oh, yeah. a, on, a, on a free country, uh, which is quite understandable. And and uh, Mozart Group, uh, it, it is a catchy name. Uh, they call you sometimes mercenaries, but you aren't mercenaries either. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, uh, Ika, we are absolutely not mercenaries. And it's, um, you know, I have guys. I have guys who get so angry about what they see, they would love to go on the front line and fight the Russians. Um, but I tell them, no, we. That, that's not why we're here. And if we do that, we lose we lose our high ground, right? We're here to help the Ukrainians to train them, uh, but we cannot be seen as mercenaries because that's not what we are. We are volunteers and, and we are supporting the Ukrainians in their righteous fight. And what do you think, how long this war is going to last? That, that is a oh. question that everybody's asking. And we're not asking yeah. anymore what came to the war. How come there is a war in 21st century on European soil? That question is tried to be answered so many times. It's not even the key question. The key question is how long is this going to take? Can we all, can the Ukrainians, can you take it all for, for a year, two years, three years? Well, you can, it's going to last at least a year and, and more. And honestly, it's hard to see an end to this because the Ukrainians are, at least the military guys we're serving with, are determined that the war cannot end while there are Russian boots on Ukrainian soil. And if you have seen what the Russians do in the areas that they occupy, you would understand that. You know, that point is, as long as Russians are occupying territory, there are Ukrainians there who are being abused, and, you know, tortured, imprisoned, uh, and, and we cannot stand for that. And so, you know, their point is, any ceasefire is a defeat for us and until all Russians are gone from our soil. And who can blame them for saying that? But the problem is, that is going to be a hard, long fight, especially as is now the West and NATO is giving support very uh, selectively, slowly, and with fear of escalation, no, you know, no um, talk about no fly zones, uh, even, you know, long range weapons are coming in very, very slowly. There's no talk of providing Ukrainians with game-changing technology like long-range precision drones, for instance. Why is um, that so? so? Yeah. Why is this so if that uh, would be game-changing? It, it's a really good question. I, I think I think the problem is this, that it, you know, if, if you have, like you do now within the U.S. administration, um, first of all, you have kind of this um, incredible inherent fear 
of of Putin's threats of escalation. And you have a lot of guys without military experience, and I I don't I, I don't object to that. That I, I you know civilian control in the military is healthy, but if you have a lot of guys uh, who are quite young and and lack military experience and they lack a sense of realism in the world, um, Putin's threats sound quite disturbing until you know, you kind of put it in perspective and say, well, actually, um, we should support the concept of Ukrainian victory. And if we support it wholeheartedly, they will win. But it's got to be wholehearted. You can't, you know, we right now, U.S. foreign policy is kind of the, the worst of all worlds. It's, um, hey, uh, we're going to provide them with all this stuff, but it's largely obsolete. And when they're really getting their butts kicked, maybe we'll give them a little bit more. You know, it's incremental. And we back down and we backpedal every time Putin pounds his chest instead of just saying, hey, we're going to give Ukrainians a bunch of long-range precision strike drones, just like the Turks did, MQ-1s, MQ-9s, mm -hmm. um, long-range ISR, um, the longest-range MLRS rockets, which are at, called ATACMs, and can range up to 100 kilometers, and we're going to pour those into this country. Um, we're going to establish no-fly zones within Ukraine over Russian-held territory. And you know what? I guarantee, I guarantee Putin isn't going to push this to the steps of nuclear war. What is he going to do? Um, he's going to watch the Russian military get annihilated, and sooner or later, the Russian military is going to stage a coup, and Putin will be gone. I mean, this is, you just have to look at Russian history. You just, I mean, it's not as though they're playing by any accepted rules. It's not as though Putin's going to go, hey, thanks, guys, for not providing really bad weaponry. And for that, I'm going to give you a pass. No, it's not. It's a bit of Western um, hypocrisy, don't you think? Um, not so much hypocrisy. It is just naivete. Uh, naivete. Uh, you could call it. Yeah, yeah, naivete. It's uh, not reading Russian history, not understanding Russian mentality, not, you know, and there's a ton of stuff ton of stuff the United States could be doing from the tactical to, to the strategic level as far as information operations. Show them pictures. Show right, them pictures you, of what do, happened. Do you talk to, to anyone from uh, U.S. government or U.K. government or anyone from European Commission or uh, when you say things like these and you are on the ground, what answers and what reactions do you get from governmental officials? Uh, you've been on CNN, you've been on um, uh, many American media as well. They've heard you. And what is the reaction of the officials in the U.S. government when you say something like this? Hey, this is a game-changing um, Very defensive. Move. Uh, not doing it's it. very, very defensive. And um, also... Uh, you know, incredibly a sense of, well, you don't understand. And then a sense of, um, well, this guy is out to lunch. And uh, what, what what is extraordinary is, you know, I served my country for 31 years. I wore the, the uniform of U.S. Marine. I was in special operations to, I fought, you know, for two decades in our nation's wars. No one can doubt my loyalty to the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why I tell my guys everything that we do here is we're going to execute U.S. foreign policy. Um, so it is, it, it is particularly to me when my own government think contrary to their policy and um you know i understand that they, they don't want to listen but uh but it seems to be extraordinary it, it really does and and again you know this is right on the heels of the debacle in afghanistan and again i mean mm -hmm. so many of us veterans watch that happen and uh and, and have seen our comrades killed uh in Afghanistan and Iraq to no end. And, and, you know, at least this war in Ukraine gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us moral clarity. We're not the invading army. We're defending against an invading army. And our cause is good. And we're, we're, again, we're not, no one can call us mercenaries. We're Such not a different killing situation. Russian soldiers. This is such yeah, a different situation really, yeah. from Afghanistan and, and, and the withdrawal of the U.S. troops and the allies, that, that, was, that was such a mess. That was such a mess, leaving so no. many uh, people stranded and getting on the evacuation planes, as many people as they could. It was such a mess. Uh, I know it. I've, I've participated in evacuation of some friends that we have there. 
that was such a mess. And like you said, um, it's a different thing now. It gives you a sense of purpose. You know exactly what you're doing, you know on what side, because in this case, there is side of evil and side of good. It's so clearly yeah. seen. It's, 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 it's very clear. Uh, I want to go back to the Ukrainian army. Uh, you have observed that, that Ukrainians are good at number of things uh, and are better than the UK and US troops in a number of key areas. What would those areas be? Well, they, they really understand, Ika, this the sense that they need what we call standoff. They need to outrange the Russians in, in uh, both as far as being able to see, you know, sensors and also to be able to strike. Um, and the the way that the Ukrainians really are uh, ahead of us, I'm talking collectively, you know, with the U.S. military, is they understand the power of drones. Drones are the future of warfare. Um, you know, everyone talks about artillery, rocket artillery. Yes, it's an effective weapon, but it's quite limited in effect, especially if you don't have forward observers down in every unit. You know, the Ukrainians do not, but every single small unit knows how to operate drones. That's why I'm saying drones are a game changer here. You know, give them longer range drones in mass, give them what we call loitering munitions that, uh, uh, you know, civilians call kamikaze drones, longer range ones. Um, and, and give them long-range strike drones. And, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent the riflemen, you know, the infantrymen, from going into harm's way. And all the technology that the Western world has amassed in the last two decades should enable that to happen. It is not. It does not here. The, the Ukrainians are taking... Um, Great casualties, not as badly as the Russians, but you've heard Zelensky talk earlier this month about uh, some 50 to 100 deaths per day, 500 wounded. Mm -hmm. uh, that's unconscionable. Why, why is a 21st century army taking these casualties when there are weapon systems that the British and the United States have that could prevent that happening? What a good question. What would be your answer exactly? What is the solution? to this. Give them well, the drones, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rush long range drones, strike ISR, uh, because those are things that can get into Ukrainian hands right away. You don't have to pull gun crews into Germany and to train them. The Ukrainians are really good at operating drones. Um, the Turkish what, uh, what, what TB2. The, what, what has to happen? What does it take to make sure to provide that kind of weaponry to, to you. Yeah, it, 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 how, how it far takes does a it have to go? Decision, How many Eva? civilians? It takes a wholehearted, it takes the president to say to DOD, hey, get these things there now. United States has, you know, when we move the president, we, we use 17 C-17s, these are large cargo airplanes, to move him and his entourage from one place to another. The United States has incredible resources. We could load a bunch of these things on a plane, get them to Warsaw, and into country within, you know, 72 to 100 hours. This is not difficult to do, but you need a wholehearted policy, not kind of an incoherent um, escalatory, uh, you know, this reminds me of, uh, you know, I wasn't around, of course, you know, I'm young like you, Ika, but so I don't remember Vietnam personally. But when you talk, when you hear about slow escalation in Vietnam, this is what reminds me of that. But of course, um, different, you know, different cause, different purpose here. Uh, everything mitigated for a very rapid, wholehearted response, a coherent Parent policy to block the Russians and make it absolutely un unfathomable, un uh, unacceptable from terms of uh, casualty losses to to con uh, continue with the invasion. The United States has not done that, but it was in their power, remains in their power to do so. And uh, U.S. President Joseph Biden says that almost on a, on a daily basis, we will do everything we can, everything in our power to ensure that this war is short and that Ukrainians have all the power and the weapons and the, the means 
to defend themselves as well as their citizens. And it, that is really not happening. We're over 100 days seeing civilians being killed, tortured, raped. Uh, you said you've been in Bucha. Uh, was it yesterday that you said you've been there? Um, yeah, I was there yesterday, but actually I was there right after mm -hmm. the Russians left. So the day after the Russians left, I was in Bucha. Really? Um, what was, still what was bodies. your recount of that? Well, how, what do you recollect from that? Well, yeah, I mean, it was it, it, it was horrific. So uh, Jeremy Bowen from the BBC had uh, actually earlier that day reported on, uh, you know, the initial report on, on the, you know, the mass. Uh, they weren't graves. They were bodies just dumped uh, in the open at that stage. Um, there were... As you drove up into Bucha, you saw car after car full of civilians that had been just machine gunned or hit by tank rounds by the Russians. So it was very clear that was there was a deliberate policy. And I've been in war, um, Ika, you know, I understand bad things happen, but this was a very, obviously, a deliberate um, approach by the Russians to, um, to, to just kill civilians. And then um, talking to the locals there at the time, they were you know, obviously very upset. They had seen uh, Russian soldiers drunk, drag, you know, friends, neighbors out of the houses, kill them. Um, you, you know, uh, awful stories about women being, you know, gang raped and, and then killed. Um, really just again, you know, I'm a professional soldier, Marine uh, by background. I, you know, I understand, uh, I understand how uh, you know, the sense of uh, fear and white hot anger sometimes when you're in combat, but nothing, nothing that I saw there um, in, in, in my just remotest imagination um, could I understand coming from a, a, a supposedly civilized military in the 21st century, barbaric behavior. That... Um what happened in Bucha and actually everything that's happening in Ukraine today reminds us all of what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the 90s. It is very much um, so. yeah. Bucha uh, account that was very similar what was going on in Srebrenica, what was going on in yeah. Piedor, uh, what was going on in Mostar. Uh, people watching it from here, uh, they had obvious uh, a very strong reactions parallels. to it as well. Great, great parallel. We, yeah. Great parallel. Even we journalists, we, we, mm. we hardly could keep it together, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah. And uh, what do you think, and, and you know what happened in Bosnia in the 90s. Uh, you, 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 yes, you, yes. You were not here, but of course, as, as serving in military, you know exactly what, what was going on in this part of the world. And uh, today, in the Western Balkans, we have a lot of pro-Russian demonstrations. We have a lot of pro-Russian politics and policies um, that are shaping our reality today in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Serbia. And there have been, uh, for example, I'll just take one example, just to see what you think about that. So Russian ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina has threatened the citizens that if they take the step towards NATO, they can expect Ukrainian scenario again in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What would you say to something like that? And, and take in consideration that Russian ambassador is still in this country. He's not a persona non grata. He's still staying here. He's very much protected. And he says things Things like this to the citizens of this country. How do you? How do you? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would say you know it's unconscionable, the right? I would, I would love to have seen him. I would love to have seen him ex expelled. You know, I mean, this is this is the problem with kind of a Russian psyche right now. It's uh, it's very bullying, isn't it? It's you know, beat your chest and threaten and. Um, the more people back down, the more that they are encouraged to bully. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see him evicted, uh, expelled from the country for, for saying that. Uh, it's, you know, I, again, this isn't about Russia and Ukraine. I, we've got volunteers here from uh, Poland, from Estonia. All of them see common cause with the Ukrainians because who's next, right? Ukrainian fall, you know, if, uh, if the Russians win here, there's no end to it. And it's not just so, about Russia. You know, it's about China, happens. Taiwan. It's about uh, Midas right. You know, I mean, you think back to, 
you know, I know um, the the values that drove Western nations in the Second World War were at times muddled, but the point is, in the end, that too was a struggle between good and evil. And um, and I think we find ourselves century. facing that again. We face yeah, that again, and exactly. we'll probably face it again and again, because that's humankind, that's humanity. This is obviously yeah. the best thing we we do, um, unfortunately. And like you said, this is not just about Russia and Ukraine. This is about all of us. It 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 concerns all of us on all sides of the world. And how long are you planning to stay in Ukraine? And, and what are your future plans? Are you continuing with, with, with the training of Ukrainian troops? Is there something new coming up? Uh, yeah, we are, Ika, we, we're going to continue here as long as we can, um, as long as the money holds out, as you know, we can sustain ourselves. And uh, we also now have an additional mission of extracting civilians, for, vulnerable civilians from uh, high risk areas, you know, in the path of the Russian army. And if, if the Russians opened humanitarian corridors, even from behind Russian lines. So that is something that we are poised to do. There is no organization in country that is better qualified. All of my guys are top tier special operations guys uh, from all over the world. And, uh, and but they've, they've drawn together. We've got an extraordinary team dynamic um, because all of them are drawn together by common cause, you know, and that's not a corny statement. I mean, um, I, I'm extraordinarily lucky to 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 be in the position of responsibility in this organization, and um, we're going to remain as long as we can. But now, you know, to my point, now we are uh, again. There are civilian populations at risk in the east, and and we're poised to help um, uh, evacuate uh, vulnerable civilian from you those said areas. This is not going to be a short war, so it's going to be at least one year. Um, yeah, least, yeah. what, what do we say to the civilians who are under the constant shelling, under the constant threat um, of, of the Russian army, of the, of the Russian mercenaries, of the Russian people, Russian president? What do we say to the civilians? Um, I've met with a lot of Ukrainian refugees when I was on uh, Polish-Ukrainian border. I spent there some time, our team spent there some time before me. and. All of the, we, we met with tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees per day that were leaving Ukraine. And we spoke to so many of them. And all of them had only one thing in their mind. This is going to be over soon and we will be able to go back home. Ovo je naprosto strašno, govori nam Marijana. Niko nije mogao zamisliti da će ovako biti. Jedan dan smo kući, a drugi bježimo s djecom preko granice. Tješi je kćerka s kojom je iz Lavova napustila sve što je imala. Došli smo danas u Poljsku. Tamo je rat, tamo nije sigurno. Rekao nam je devetogodišnji Juri i dodao hrabro da ga nije strah. Uh, no. Njegova petogodišnja sestra, Sofija, danas je obradovana s okićem i slatkišem. Njihova majka nam je rekla da će pokušati doći do Njemačke. Ja vam pire dati slavanje njima u to što mi pire žili tam, eti bombe, eti rakete, kateri po četiri raza za noć obstreljivali nas. Mi s djetmi u podvali, pogrebe prijatelji smo. Do domu jedu, do svoga domu. U koji grad? Ivano-Frankijska oblast. Ali je rat, rat Ukrajine, ne bojite se, nemate strah? Je strah, ali tam mi je. I nadijem se na krašće. Nije vas strah? No, bilš menš tam spokojno. Да, наші хлопці захищають. Добре, від серця та від душі. Дуже дякуємо. Вся Україна дякує. In the end, everything will be okay and in the end, uh, we will have really a good life and good uh, I don't know, but everything really be okay. What we say to the people um, when we meet them, 
How do we say the hard truth? And this is something that we as journalists also uh, um, come across and find it very difficult to do. Well, you can't. You know, in, in Western Ukraine, a lot of those refugees have already moved back to include Kiev. Uh, but I, I will tell you that, you know, the draw of going back to your home will overcome a lot of fear. Uh, even those even those areas that the Russians have left and and uh, refugees have returned to are not necessarily safe uh, in in areas of northern Kiev and, and and to the east. The Russians have used uh, they've used widespread use of um, landmines, uh, cluster munitions. So the threat is still there. But the point is that you know people want to return home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even now in the path of the Russian army, uh, people are clinging on to hope that the Ukrainians will, the Ukrainian military will be able to defend their areas. Um, it's just, I mean, you remember this from your own country's history. People, it's only really in extremists that people will be driven to, to leave their homes. And it's just a tragedy of this war and every war um, that uh, civilians will continue to die um, because of that, you know, because of that that inclination to 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 cling to what they have. And Andy, just one last question. I'm not going to take uh, take too much of your time. Um, I already have. Um, what do you need? What does Mozart Group needs at this point? What do you need more so you can do your job I better? And continue um, doing you your know, job. I'm smiling. I'm smiling, Iko, because really, very simply, it's money. Uh, the U.S. government is not funding us; will never fund us. And so, it, you know, if you go to our website, every bit counts. You can either join us. We welcome guys with their uh, military backgrounds who can train. We don't put people, uh, you know, in in harm's way. And I mean, everyone here is at risk. All our guys are at risk. I understand that. But my point is, we're not reckless. Um, but if you do have guys who want to join us, um, uh, just to train Ukrainians, we welcome that. We welcome any donations. You know, what I mean. We, we one of the one of the really poignant things is a lot of our donations come from people who, you know, are clearly cannot afford much. Um, but I can guarantee you this: EK, every single penny uh, that is donated goes to um, it. Really does go to contribute to the to training Ukrainians um, from you know to 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 enable them to defend their own lives, to save lives, um, and let's be honest, you know, to, to drive the Russians back from their homeland. And I think that's a penny well spent because it's, again, it's more than just about Russia and Ukraine. I would, I would, I would absolutely agree with you, considering everything that we just listed as well. Uh, Andy, good luck. Um, which best of luck to you and to your guys. Uh, I'm hoping to stay in touch. Uh, I would be interested in, in seeing what's going on and far, how far have you guys gotten uh, in a month, in two months, in three months uh, to follow up on the story. And for now, I want to thank you for, for being my guest tonight. Thank, thank you, Ike. And I, I would like to just invite uh, your you, you know, your viewers to visit our website. You know, I mean, regardless, uh, www.themozartgroup.com. Uh, and, and it just talks about what we're doing, why we're here, and gives a little bit of background on, on what we're doing. And we also have a Facebook page. We're on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, my daughter tells me. So we will. Yeah. please, yeah, please. <laughs> we do will it. put it here on, our, so on our screen. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Uh, moj gost je bio bivši američki marinac koji je služio u Iraku i Afganistanu. Trenutno je u Ukrajini i formirao je Mozart Group, organizaciju koja trenutno pomaže u, uh, pomaže u obuci ukrajinskih snaga za specijalne operacije. Uh, Andy Milburn, ja sam Ika Ferrer-Gotić. Ostanite i dalje uz program N1.
глазом как бы 